All right. Um, hi, everybody. I am so happy to be here today and talk to you and geek out about fashion and money, a topic I could literally talk about all day, every day. Uh, my name is Michelle Gabriel, and I am a lecturer of sustainable fashion strategy, as well as the director of career services and strategic partnerships at Glasgow Caledonian New York College, otherwise known as GCNYC. I am also a PhD candidate at the Unis Center for Social Business and Health at Glasgow Caledonian University in Glasgow, Scotland, uh, where I am investigating kind of the intersection of social innovation, economics, and the fashion industry. So we'll see where that goes. I'm in the middle of that journey. Um, but I am here today with Fashion Revolution USA as part of the money and fashion uh, focus. And today we're going to talk about how fashion created capitalism. Uh, please stay engaged throughout this talk. I want to answer your questions and have an open dialogue. Uh, so please submit your questions as they come up for you and we'll address them at the end of the talk. Um, so today's topic is fashion and capitalism. What do I mean by that? And what do I mean by fashion created capitalism? So a lot of times when we are talking or having conversations about the problems or the challenges of the fashion industry today, whether we're talking about overconsumption or we're talking about managing waste or we're talking about um, uh, you know uh, the loss of human life in in disasters like Rana Plaza we are we're kind of like there's an undercurrent conversation that may not be overt sometimes it is overt uh, about how capitalism and the system of capitalism has a big hand in getting us collectively to this point where like bad things are happening in the fashion industry. So no doubt, no doubt, capitalism really takes fashion and like pumps it up and to takes it to another level. But if we look a little bit closer at the fashion uh, industry and fashion as a concept, we can see that like fashion really does bad all by itself. Um, and if we look at the histories of both fashion and capitalism, it isn't the economic system of capitalism that created the opportunity for fashion to grow and uh, be what we see it is today, uh, full of problems. It actually is fashion that paved the way for capitalism to grow, to cross borders, and to be the prevailing economic system that exists today. So let's like have some baseline facts real quick just for this discussion. So according to the United States Senate Joint Economic Committee um, report from 2019, fashion in US dollars is a $2.5 trillion industry. It's a very big industry. Fashion is, if it's not the largest, it is one of the largest uh, industries in the world. And it touches almost, if not every country in the world. Um, and almost every single human across the globe today. It employs the largest workforce globally, like labor workforce that actually does hand labor. Um, and it crosses sector boundaries in a way that is unique and unlike most other industries of any kind. Uh, it touches agriculture, it touches gas and oil, it uh, touches transport, including maritime and air. Uh, it has financial components and financialization, and it also does petrochemicals, among other things, but these are just examples. So um, despite these stats, it is an industry largest, largely seen as frivolous uh, and not worthy of policy or attention. There are many reasons for that, um, the most significant of which I believe is because it mostly employs women. But today's topic is not fashion and gender, it is fashion and money. So we'll save that for another time. Um, so let's, we need some foundations for this discussion. And let's just have like a mini short history lesson. Um, clothing has not always been known as fashion. There was a time when clothing was just clothing. Uh, let's turn back the clocks, boop, 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 to Europe pre-Industrial Revolution. Europe was largely a feudal society, and if you don't know what that means, it just means that society was very rigidly structured, and land-owning elite, um, and uh, it was rigidly structured into land-owning elite and like serfs. And those were just people that kind of served the land-owning elite and worked the land. The governing system was largely monarchies, and the system uh, really emerged in the 8th century and really went on to the Russian Revolution. Clothing in this system was really, really regulated. So clothing obvi obviously existed, people were clothed, but it was really highly regulated. Um, and it was regulated 
to keep class distinctions very tight. So this was regulated by something called sumptuary laws, among other things. Sumptuary laws um, basically uh, can, like, royalty can only wear blue. That's an example of a sumptuary law. So it meant that like lower classes were not legally allowed to utilize certain pieces of clothing. They couldn't afford them anyway, but they certainly weren't allowed to and they could be put in jail. Mercantilism is another thing that's kind of emerging across the end of feudalism. And mercantilism is just trade across borders. It's a system of trade across borders, which really didn't exist um, previous to it. Um, fabric, uh, and, and it existed from like the 15th century to the 18th century. It um, was really fueled by fiber and fabric. So mercantilism is growing and it's trading in fiber and fabric among other things. Mercantilism starts eroding these class structures that feudalism has. So it kind of starts creating this new upper middle class, eventually known as the bourgeoisie. This upper middle class starts to have money, their new money. And so they can be like, yo, I wanna wear that because I have the dollars and I actually am trading in the stuff. So I wanna look like the monarchs. I wanna look like the rich kids. Um, and they start mimicking the, uh, the clothing trends of the upper classes. So long story short, this creates a world where class is changeable. This was not possible before that and that status through clothing can be bought. Uh, do you, how do you think the monarchs and the rich people uh, liked that? Uh, they were like, hell no, hell no. Um, if new money can buy this look, I'm changing my look. Uh, this creates the idea as early as the 1600s of manufactured newness for newness sake. Um, in order to like kind of uh, allow those upper classes to have a distinct look and then those in turn, those you know, kind of lower classes, including that newly uh, rich kid class, they start mimicking. And so this begins a cycle um, of fashion. Bart, who is like a theorist in fashion um, in the 20th century, I love his definition of fashion. And he says that fashion uh, is the collective imitation of regular novelty. So fashion is not clothing, fashion is novelty. That's really important to note when we're talking about how do we fix fashion. Fashion is novelty. Um, at the same time, these mercantile traders are uh, have made a case that fiber and fabric are really saleable items. And fashion is a saleable concept. Uh, and those with money start to see the value of these things um, and, and selling them more and more. There's a great quote from a, a written book in the 1690s, if you can believe it, uh, called Discourse of Trade. Don't expect you to look it up. I'm gonna short chain, or shorthand it for you. Fashion or the alteration of dress is a great promoter of trade because it occasions the expanse of clothes before the old ones are worn out. It is the spirit of life of trade. So that was from a dude named Brabant in 1690. In 1690, they recognized that making fashion for fashion's sake was good business. This stuff at this point in time, fabric and fiber and clothing are cottage industry. They're largely happening in people's homes, small little weaving things and they're maybe selling to one you know, rich person or a monarch. This isn't gonna meet this emerging demand in, you know, including the imports of these new fibers from the colonies of the empire of Britain. Um, and it starts to begin a process of industrialization as early as the 1700s. The textile industry is the catalyst for that industrialization. Uh, it would never have happened as fast or as immediate if it weren't for the emerging fashion industry. The industrial revolution in turn is a catalyst for what becomes capitalism. This combo creates a need for a fashion industry to capitalize on the inherent quality of fashion that we just talked about, that ephemerality, that newness for newness sake. And, it, uh, and, and so it, it became a process to, to clothe people. Uh, what was a process to clothe people becomes a process to create fashion for fashion's sake. Um, and with the emergence of capitalism, these two systems, fashion and capitalism, go on to energetically fuel one another. So in what I just said, fashion, the emergence of newness for newness sake, 
creates an energetic catalyst for capitalism to be like, wait, hold up, I want in on that. Give me some of that energy. They then start to kind of fuel one another and, and ultimately expand the reach of one another. So capitalism is, it, it needs fashion cycles to have been created and grow at the rate it did. Um, and it needs fashion's planned obsolescence. Otherwise it would have probably emerged a lot slower and um, maybe grown at a different rate and expanded in a different way. Fashion benefits from the hype man of capitalism. Capitalism is like biggest cheerleader of fashion um, and it is in service of fashion. So if we go back to our early fact that I mentioned about the scale and the scope of the fashion industry and how far reaching it is, um, fashion, we can see that fashion basically spread capitalism. It went from the Americas through industrialization of the cotton trade, which began the legacy of total destruction of both uh, the indigenous populations of the Americas, as well as the, through the slave trade. Really sorry about my dogs. Um, uh, and in order to expand and uh, fuel the industry, it needed all of those things too. So it was very mutually beneficial. It then moved eastward over the years um, and elsewhere as it sought resources to turn into products. So this is really colonization. We can have a whole talk about that. Um, and it, it looked for people to exploit in order to expand that industry and people to sell to, to continue to expand that industry. So you can see when I say fashion can do battle by itself, the idea of fashion is embedded with newness for newness sake. And the ethos from the start of the creation of the idea of fashion, let alone the industry of fashion, um, emerged and created kind of an us and them dynamic, an other, it automatically created an other group. Um, those that were in fashion and those that were out of fashion. This helped fuel status and all class and all these other components that really support this kind of uh, turnover of product and novelty and ultimately grew capitalism and took advantage of the energy of capitalism and vice versa to exploit people from the beginning. So what does this mean? What does this mean for today? I find these things really fascinating and really interesting because when we have conversations about, oh, you know, we can fix our ills if we just stop fast fashion. Fast fashion is simply a product of what the industry is, of what it is at its core, of what the idea of fashion is at its core. How do we stop these things? It's a much bigger undertaking with not one answer. We have to have deep kind of understanding of the psychology of fashion. We have to understand how fashion and money interact and how kind of mutually beneficial those systems are. If we are ever going to unpack even one portion of the challenges that the industry faces. Um, fashion may be in hyperdrive today, but it's because capitalism is in hyperdrive today. And the problems, however, are not new they are baked in. Um, this is obviously very scary and very challenging and it means a lot of really challenging things for unpacking where money um, manifests and where money motivates within the fashion industry. But really at its core, the idea of fashion is about turnover and novelty. And until we have like a different relationship potentially to clothing and you know, this is a whole other talk, but but clothing is so meaningful. It, is, it isn't just a means to keep us warm or keep us safe, it is identity. It is um, societal participation. It is in groups and out groups. It is so much a part of who we are as individuals, who we are as a community, who we are as a society, as a nation, as a world. You know, until we kind of have like more critical conversations around those topics, which are really hard, they're really theoretical, not everyone loves those kind of conversations, it's gonna be very challenging to impact kind of the symptoms of the disease. Um, the disease itself is fashion. The, the symptoms are fast fashion. The symptoms are late stage capitalism. Um, you know, these things are product of the system itself. Um, 
So before we jump into questions, I kind of want to show you some of my sources because it's really important that, um, you know, certainly I, I think my ideas are right, but they're, they're based in, in other people's work too. And, and um, so I just want to share some things that I hope you look into or that is uh, valuable to you if you, uh, on any level. So economically, I, w I read a lot of economic stuff, but I really, um, you know, we really have to go back to a lot of economists that were kind of emergent at um, like the New Deal era of the United States, because that was kind of like one of the last real conversations around uh, what kind of society do we want to have and what kind of role does capitalism have? And so um, Karl Polanyi is a really important uh, theorist and economist in this space. Um, so The Great Transformation is a book I utilize a lot. The Cost of Economic Growth but, um, by E.J. Michon is also really good. Uh, Galbraith is an economist I, I look to all the time for kind of frameworks uh, to envision different ways to think about value. Um, but in terms of fashion, uh, there are just so many great uh, ways to look at this and a lot of uh, these things exist in books. And so uh, one of my favorite books, this is a recent one, I really recommend it, is uh, Maxime Bada's recent book, Unraveled. Um, she really takes down the systems of fashion and really kind of picks them apart by way of a pair of jeans. So highly recommend this book. It is very readable and, and whether you're a scholar or just coming uh, to understand some of these concepts, this is a great book. Um, some uh, other books that I love and I utilize a lot in my academic work is uh, Thinking Through Fashion. So this is uh, a lot about the theories, um, the, the intersection of fashion with capitalism, our identities, um, and this is by, um, or it's edited by uh, Rakamora and Smelik, but it's the chapters are written by various people. Um, and then another one that is really great is Adorned in Dreams by Elizabeth Wilson. This one really has a really great conversation about our relationship to capitalism and fashion. And um, The Fashioned Body uh, by uh, Aunt Whistle. This is a really great book as well about kind of the intersection of fashion and capitalism. I have a bunch of other ones um, that I really recommend you read. I'll just kind of flip through them. Um, Beverly Lemire is like kind of the OG in this space. She has so many wonderful books. A lot of them are out of print, unfortunately, so they're really challenging to find. But a great resource if you are an FIT student is FIT has a really great library. Finally, a book you really must read to unpack kind of some of these big, big questions is Danella Meadows' Thinking in Systems. You cannot unpack a organization, a system, like fashion without the tools to kind of answer very big questions. Um, and systems thinking and systems theory is a way to do that. And it's a really useful tactical theory that gives you kind of step-by-step -step instructions on how to and what to look for when you're trying to investigate a very complex, very multifaceted, very layered system like fashion or like capitalism. And just as a hint, look for the feedback loops and look for the goals. What is the system's goal? So why I talk about what is fashion's inherent quality, uh, that newness for newness sake, it's about understanding that fashion has always, its goal has always been ephemerality. And if we understand that that is the goal, then you know getting rid of fast fashion doesn't fix our problems. Um, and that's really important. And then from there, you can find feedback loops and you can see what systems are kind of self-reinforcing. Um, so the, these are some really great resources. So I'm gonna kind of comb through here and see your questions and sorry if I missed any of them, but um, uh, I really appreciate this. Um, let's see. Um, oh my gosh, thanks guys for so many nice comments. Um, so any any questions? I know these things are really kind of uh, lofty and esoteric, and they can be. But um, so this uh, great question. This uh, this live session will be posted, and I also will. Um, if you hop over to my um, Instagram after this, I'm going to post, and I'm sure Fashion Revolution can repost it as well. I'm going to post all my sources 
Um, so in case you miss them here, I'm gonna make sure that you can come back and find them um, so you can investigate these things yourself and delve deeper into them. Um, but, you know, once you begin to unpack some of the things that, you know, uh, we talked about today about the intersection of fashion and capitalism, you can kind of see where overconsumption comes from. This is something I'm investigating right now in a couple of papers I'm doing and, it's, uh, and some conferences I'm attending. Oh, great, we have a question. So um, could you talk more about the academic books you showed? The video is showing the books flipped, so I couldn't, oh, so sorry. Um, uh, and also, can you share thoughts on fashion's relationship to capitalism moving forward in a more sustainable future? Great question, thank you so much. So. Like I said, the books, um, it's probably easier. I'm gonna put them on my own Instagram and I'll share them with Fashion Revolution so they can repost them um, uh, because there's a long list and it's probably easier for you to search them that way. Um, but in terms of moving forward, you know, I, I'm really heartened by the conversation that I'm seeing emerging over the last couple of years, especially as we live through COVID and we, the impacts of COVID about critical conversation around capitalism. Now, I'm not saying we just like blow up capitalism, but ultimately I think people are coming to terms that this system has goals that are not aligned to their own. And it might be time to uh, put guardrails on it, to reevaluate it, to adjust components of it so that it might reevaluate what value means um, and might be more aligned to a society that we find more um, useful to a broader group of people. And so with kind of that conversation, I'm really um, hopeful that fashion can be part of that conversation because if we know that fashion is really a secret engine for capitalism, and secret in that no one talks about it, not that it can't be found. Um, and there's a lot of reasons. I, you know, I alluded to why I think people don't like to talk about fashion or why fashion isn't thought of seriously. Um, and why it doesn't get attention or policy. Um, but I think in having a critical conversation about what is working and what isn't working about capitalism um, and how we might envision a future that might be more uh, inclusive or serving, that we can envision a future for both fashion and capitalism that uh, embeds more good than bad. Uh, if I'm being real and I'm speaking from my own uh, kind of investigation and my own personal feeling, I before I became an academic, I worked in the industry for a long time um, across all kinds of things. I've uh, seen all kinds of parts of the supply chain all over the world, and I don't feel super confident about the industry's ability to change. Um, we have no regulation. We are relying on businesses whose interest is selling to police, to consider different ways to sell, to maybe not sell, that's just dumb. That's not really realistic to assume that the interest of those organizations are gonna be anything other than what they were built for. So this is also, again, coming back to systems thinking is, what are the goals of those systems? Those businesses, the systems of those businesses, they're set up to sell. That's what they're supposed to do. Asking them to do anything else seems like a folly to me. What other systems might we invent? What different ways might we operate um, that can create different systems that have different goals? Um, how do we create different systems? Uh, we demand change. One of the most powerful ways in which we can change the world is through collective action. And collective action um, can happen in a lot of different ways, but it can happen from just simply speaking up um, individually and making your voice known. Um, and, and asking for things that we know we need in order to have a better fashion industry and have a better relationship between fashion and capitalism. Um, a great example, not necessarily in the, in the, exclusively in the money space, but a great example of collective action is the passing of SB 62. That had gone to the legislature in California many times, or, or at least one time, um, and didn't make it past committee. Um, the collective action of citizens saying, this is important to me, led to others taking that seriously, led to um, press and all kinds of other momentum that ultimately really put pressure on those that had positions of power to make something happen within government to make something happen. And we hope that that can be a catalyst for other such policy across New York or across the United States or in a global setting. So, 
you know, uh, I hope that answers the question. Uh, but if I'm being real, I'm not super confident that we are going to kind of organically get to a better place. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, we are running short on time. So I, I want to um, thank you so much for joining me today. I want to thank you so much for engaging with this conversation. It's really important. Um, I know that it can seem like sometimes these things are intangible, but ultimately these ideas have real effects on our lives and they really um, put pressures on people and they change the way we operate within the world. And if we kind of recognize that and we're able to see these systems and we're able to see these mechanisms, that means we can change them. And that means we can throw kind of rocks at these glass houses in certain ways and investigate ways to do things differently. Um, you know, envisioning worlds we want to see is always a great goal setting mechanism because we can say, I wish the world looked like this. And we can begin to unpack what it might take to build a world like that. But it might be enough to just say, I don't like it this way. And it's important for me to even say that change is necessary because frankly, the industry is at such an early stage with such a big journey ahead of itself to be something that is not destructive and not an agent for just really, really negative consequences that to just ask for change is really the stage we're at. And so using your voice to ask for change, considering your habits of consumption, um, considering what it means in your relationship to fashion is really important and can't be understated. So I ask you to think about that. Um, but you know, again, uh, you can always find me at GCNYC. I am happy to continue to answer questions for anybody. Uh, these are things I'm going to be investigating for a long time, and I hope that uh, you begin looking into them too. So with that, I will say thank you, and I hope you all have a great day, and uh, thanks for tuning in.